Okay, everybody hear me all right? Okay, see a couple nods, good. Uh, well, welcome back um, to our Department of Art visiting speaker series. We're gonna stick with our, our routine uh, where in a, a few minutes when we get started, um, I'll just ask that everyone keeps their cameras on and their mics off and at the end. Uh, yeah, this and, one's, this one's uh, somebody's mic is on. If you if you want to turn those on at the end, um, there will be some time to talk, to talk directly to the uh, artist. So I don't know. Just take take a take a moment to double check that your um, your mic is disabled because I hear a few um, that might not be. Um, okay, so um, I'm pleased to welcome Michael Ashkin this evening. Ashkin is a professor of sculpture at Cornell University in the Department of Art, Architecture, and Planning. Um, so I'll just say I first encountered uh, Ashkin's work many years ago um, when I went to the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York. Uh, the work at that time took the form of meticulously crafted diorama sculptures based on desolate sites impacted by human intervention. The tabletop and floor covering installations were powerful likenesses of great ecological expanses retold through precise detail, influenced perhaps by the locations, materials, and concepts incorporated into the massive sculptural gestures of land artist predecessors. It seemed that Ashkin's non-site works expanded on environmentally sensitive studies, inventively expressed in a way that was processed through his deaf craftsmanship and an innovative way of shifting the position and understanding of marginal places to the center of our attention. Um, you could think of it as a study of consequences. Following this work, Ashkin continued deep site explorations and poetical representation through sculptural work, photography, text, video, and other modes of production. His work has been an evolving inquiry into post-industrial landscapes, beautifully disturbing wastelands framed to have their own articulate voice formed from locational identity. Ashkid's more recent cardboard renderings of imagined city plans strikingly offer a specificity of place while portraying ad hoc conditions of complexity and growth. Ashkid's work continues to address issues of landscape and urbanism specifically the intersection of subjectivity with the social, economic, and political production of space. He takes as his subjects, plazas, byways, prisons, suburbs, places of resource extraction, territories that shape and are shaped by social constructs. Ashkin's work has been widely exhibited in galleries and museums around the world. He has published three photo books, Horizont, which explores the fragments and contradictions in districts beyond the city center, Long Branch, documenting the eradication of a New Jersey working class beachfront neighborhood by corrupt forces, and most recently, were it not for a study of the Mojave Desert. So tonight, we're pleased to welcome Michael Ashkin to UB. Michael, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Max. That was a, a very comprehensive reminder of everything I've done and forgotten about. <laughs> so um, let me let me start off here. And uh, I just, you know, I haven't, I did an artist talk the other day. But uh, before that, I hadn't done an artist talk in a couple, a couple of years, I was I was ill for about a year. And coming back and looking at the work again, all of a sudden, I realized that I had to get acquainted, reacquainted with everything I had done. And it seemed too that like some of the the things I thought I might say about the work have changed in the meantime, which is really interesting to me, um, which leads me to a kind of observation, a general observation that I've uh, made several times in my career. And I'm sure I'm not alone as an artist in making this, but it's to a certain extent, like all artist talks are, are, are fictions, you know, <laughs> because you know, you look at everything you've done from the perspective of where you are at this moment and that moment is constantly changing. Um, so you're constantly recontextualizing what you've done in the past. But it, like I have a tendency, and I think everybody does, of saying, well, I did this, and then I thought of this and did that. And in fact, a lot of that didn't happen in that sequence at all. And it, in fact, it's 
pretty hard to reconstruct exactly what the course of your own thinking was, um, especially the chronology of it. So a lot of this is not necessarily so much cause and effect, even though I may frame it that way from time to time, but it's kind of like a uh, rhizomatic connection of ideas that are seen from my perspective right now. Um, I thought I might start out before I show you any slides, maybe just to um, kind of in a general way, um, tell you what it is I, I think about in, a, in, in, the, in the large sense. Um, and I'll, but it is kind of like a mini lecture, shouldn't go more than like five or six minutes. Um, and then I'll get into my work. Um, I guess uh, the overriding concern that I've always had in my work has been uh, with the landscape. Um, I guess it's largely because of like a largely a, sil a solitary child growing up. And uh, a lot of the time I spent as a child was in the woods, um, spent thinking and kind of fantasizing about what, what those woods really were. You know, they were like dark scary places and you know I was small and so everything seemed oversized and um, I, I, I've noticed that you know the, the landscape is largely a kind of a, a result of what one thinks about it and I think I've brought that kind of perspective to everything I've done since I mean as adults when we look at the landscape right especially in our you know we're all adults or young adults and you know we've seen everything we've seen movies we've seen we've driven in cars everywhere we've flown different places in the world and basically at this point you know i think the landscape presents us with like a self-evident presence you know you look out and you kind of see what you expect to see right i mean globally things look the same in many different places we're used to seeing the same shopping malls cars streets whatever um, and not, not giving too much thought about it beyond that. And we basically, we accept what we see. Um, but I'm sure all of us have thought, you know, at, at many times, you know, what, that there is in fact more than what we're seeing, right? Um, and, and the question presents itself, what is really behind what we're seeing? Um, you know, what, what is the construction of seeing? Like, how, how is it that we see what we see? And, and you know what how do forces outside us produce what we see um so i figured i'd start with a few words about the structure of seeing and from that i'm going to go to a quote that i'm going to put up on the screen and this will kind of begin the slideshow find my way through Can everybody see that okay? All right. So this is just an opening. Ah, down here. Okay, so this is just a, I, I recently, just a couple days ago, just took a screenshot of this page from a book, um, which is about kind of poetic and prose language. And I wanted to start with a uh, quote from um, Victor, uh, about, about Viktor Shlavsky's, um, he's a Russian formalist uh, writer and theoretician, um, talking about language. Because I think it's important to realize that what we see is also largely a function of you know, what we say and are able to say. Like in a, in a way, you can't see anything in the world without being able to really speak it in some way. I'm sure you're, <clears throat> those of you who have taken psychology 101 you know you know that a baby when it looks at objects doesn't know what they necessarily are and it's only after after they know what it is that they can actually see it um, and even as adults when we see something we only see various points of the object and we put together those points very quickly in our mind and then those points suggest an object that we name like a table we'll only see two or three points of the table and we say table and we know it's a table. So <clears throat> what I want to, I guess my, my kind of general hypothesis is that what we see is largely a function of kind of like algebraic and geometric logic. 
in this is in the modern world that I'm speaking of. And by algebraic, I'm talking about language and I'll read you what it says here. And then um, here, that's uh, Shlavsky. Shlavsky's argument in these studies turns upon a distinction between automatized and aesthetic forms of per perception. So you're talking about basically prose versus poetic perception. If we start to examine the general laws of perception, he writes in Art as Technique, we see that as perception becomes habitual, it becomes automatic. Our daily lives, that is to say, are composed of repeated and innumerable encounters with the world, such that our perception of the world and these encounters tends to become less than fully conscious. Indeed, so habituated do we become to the presence, sorry, presence of the world, so familiar do we become with our environment and all that it contains that we fall into what Slavsky calls an algebraic method of thought, according to which the world comes to be perceived not as a world of objects, but as a world of ciphers and outlines. And then there's this beautiful quote of his. By this, quote, algebraic method of thought, we apprehend objects only as shapes with imprecise extensions. We do not see them in their entirety, but rather recognize them by their main characteristics. We see the object as though it were enveloped in a sack. We know what it is by its configuration, but we see only its silhouette. The object perceived thus in the manner of prose perception fades and does not even leave a first impression. The process of algebraization and the over automization of an object permits the greatest economy of perceptive effort. Either objects are assigned only one proper feature, a number, for example, or else they function as though by formula and do not even appear in cognition. <clears throat> All life, in other words, is a life of prose perception. Things are known even as the meaning of words are gleaned from an utterance in po prose, but things are not perceived. They are like words which disappear before the meanings they transmit. To put it another way, our world is a world that of essences abstracted from a sensible world. <clears throat> so automatic is this process of abstraction that the world of things no longer registers upon our senses. <clears throat> and then this beautiful quote, and so life is reckoned as nothing, Shklovsky goes on to say, and in a wonderful apertu says, he adds, habitualization devours work, clothes, furniture, one's wife, and the fear of war. So that's, I, I would, that's the algebra component of seeing, um, basically seeing things just through the language we use day to day. And this language is also like set up grammatically in such a way that something does something to X, we see X. So you have, you have objects, indirect objects, and you have, you know, the subject. So basically the, the, the logic of the world is largely guaranteed by the grammatics of it. Um, Okay, let's talk about geometry in a way. And by geometry, I'm referring to like perspectival perception of the world. Um, there's a really uh, great book, which I'll, I'll show you in a, this, whoa, there it is. Perspective is symbolic form. I don't know how many of you have seen that book or read it, but it's really worth reading. It's very short. It's got, it's actually not that short a book, but the actual text is short and the footnotes go on forever. So there's more footnotes in the book than, than actual text, which is great if you really want to get into it. But basically what he says is that sim, uh, perspective as we have it now in the West um, is a, largely a cultural construction and it's just it's historically constructed. And he goes through a kind of a history of perspective in the West um, from Roman times through the medieval, medieval period and then into the Renaissance. Um, so basically, um, starting with Roman times, we have this kind of concentration on the object. I mean, they look kind of perspectival, but the perspective isn't really correct in the sense that we think of perspective as correct, like photographically correct. There tends to be an object which is perhaps a little more important than other objects. And even if that object is in the distance, it's magnified. So it's kind of perceptual in a way. You know, it's the way we see things. If you see a friend of yours coming down the street, that friend will appear bigger than its surroundings because you're interested in your friend, right? 
Um, I'm sure you've all noticed the situation where you take a photograph of something and you say, wow, there that thing is, I'm going to take a picture of it. And then you actually look at the picture and it's really small because in fact, it was much smaller than your, your brain, which magnified it, um, allowed you to perceive. So we started with Roman percep perception, uh, perception, which is largely based on the, the uh, objects within kind of a field and, and not a kind of an, a, a spatial relationship necessarily between the object and the field. And in fact, if we, we, we look further, we find out that the space in which objects find themselves is to a large extent still the space of the gods. In some extent, to some extent, spaces didn't exist unless they had a god assigned to them. So there's this kind of disconnect. Then we go to the medieval period. I'm sure you're all familiar with these kind of paintings that look so strange to our eyes. And this God's world and more important, or to the particular narrative being told, the larger the, the person or object in the, in the painting is. Um, and so this in a way leads naturally to our perspective. So you go from God's perspective in the medieval period um, back to, of course, to kind of everything, we're, what we're so familiar with, is, which is you know the, the space as a grid in which everything is allotted its um, mathematical space in a, in an infinitely receding um, uh, field, window, so to speak. So this is the way we think uh, space really is organized, right? I mean, this, if you see something that doesn't look like this, you may accept it, but you think it's an aberration, right? And there are different other forms of uh, Renaissance space. There's like, okay, we have perspective on the left, but we have isometric and axonometric, which are rationalized forms of vision, which allow you to measure on a drawing. These are engineering drawings and architectural drawings are often drawn in these two different forms. And these two forms emerged in the um, Renaissance as well. And largely used for military purposes. So you can measure the trajectory of a cannonball, you know, that would be fired at a certain part of a, uh, of a fortress. So these two books, I would say, are really great reference to the history of perspective. The one on the left is about perspective as like single point perspective. The book on the right is more about um, isometric and axonometric perspective. <laughs> okay. um, so, and these are just a couple of other books that talk about other modes of perspective and language um, kind of in non-Western uh, kind of anth from anthropological studies. Um, covering, the, I'm sure these books are to some extent outdated, but I find them uh, extremely easy to read in beautiful language. Casarier is, is really kind of a, a wonderful um, describer of other ways, other cultures and ways of seeing the world, <clears throat> both through language and through vis 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 visual structure. Okay, so um, so yeah, so I just wanted to say, to sum it up, you know, we have an algebraic and kind of geometric way of looking at the world, um, but we also see the world, which is, you know, in a way colored by history, you know, what we know of history, and basically the history that we invoke when we see the world is like Western history that's constructed along linear time, um, you know, and it's kind of the history of great events great people, that kind of thing. The victors actually tell history, right? The, it's the victors and the losers history is essentially eradicated or rewritten to favor the victors. Um, there's so much of that in our own American history. Um, and then there, of course, we see the landscape, I also think from the point of view of value, okay? Um, and by value, I kind of mean in the capitalist sense of exchange value, where everything is looked at from the point of view of a commodity. Like even if you're not consciously thinking of it as a commodity, you think of it in terms of a value structure that is relational. This is worth more than this is. Um, but of course, you know, there are many other ways of seeing the world and, you know, the, from other perspectival systems, um, like the Chinese perspectival system is extremely interesting. If anybody's interested in a reading on how Chinese perspective worked um, and how it was seen, how Western perspective was seen from from the perspective of the the, the Chinese court when they first uh, saw 
Renaissance paintings. Um, also, there are other, of course, many other languages. Poetic language, of course, is another way of seeing the world. Animistic, pre-enlightenment languages um, are, are also completely reconstruct space. And of course, you know, there's the other like uh, space told from other historical perspectives, like pers particularly indigenous perspectives. Um, so now we can get into the work. <laughs> And uh, here I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll start relating back to some of that content here and there and in, in other registers as well. So this, this is the first work I'm going to show you. I actually made this work back probably in like 1993, as soon as I got out of grad school. So I went to grad school for painting, um, but as soon as I left, I started making sculpture. I mean, I guess I made some sculpture while I was in grad school, but um, I didn't make painting for another, you know, at least 20 years after I finished my degree. I went to the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so <clears throat> I had made a few kind of architectural models that were kind of awkward and I won't show them to you here. Um, but then in the process of making those models, I decided it might be good to anchor them on the ground. So I put them on the ground. And then I thought once they were on the ground, because I'd made the ground kind of realistic looking, then I decided well, let's make it about the landscape because that's kind of really what I wanted to do. And I realized I don't have to make an actual sculpture and put it on this landscape. I can kind of make a sculpture that uses like forms from the real landscape and that will be a sculpture, right? So um, this one here, there's still kind of a sculptural component to it, you know? I mean, because I built this, I had to figure out how to build this, um, this billboard, um, I, I've been considering, you know, like when I was in grad school, try to do some performance where I lived between two billboards. When I lived in Chicago, I noticed all these billboards where you could climb up into them and hide. And I thought, well, what? I, my fantasy kind of took off. <clears throat> and then I realized, well, I'll just build this little model. So this model here is like, there's a little guy up living in there between the billboards and he's been discovered and, you know, the authorities have come to take him down essentially. Um, and as I, as I finished this piece, I decided it needed a title. And so um, I gave it the title uh, for months, he lived between the billboards. So this piece was kind of, although right now I look at it and it seems primitively built and, you know, awkward in a lot of ways, I would have built it completely different now, I guess. But I mean, it was kind of radical for me because all of a sudden I started using store-bought materials which I, you know, often altered, um, and uh, but I also built components like the highway. I built out of wood that I cut with miniature tables so on that kind of thing. Um, but I also started using text with the uh, with the models, and the text um, here is kind of largely descriptive, but it became less so as very quickly. There's another shot of the same model. Um, this is a piece I made shortly thereafter. Um, it was about 25 feet long and uh, it was really horribly built. It would fall apart if it fell over sideways, but it was a power line running across the desert. And to the right, there's like a little guy, little guy who got out of his car um, and is heading towards the horizon. And uh, the title of that piece was, um, he set off along the power lines. There's a detail of it. There's a piece that I like, but unfortunately it's not on its proper stand. It's just lying on my studio floor. That's the only picture I have of it. Um, well, yeah, and two other pictures, but. Um, <clears throat> and this one, I, th I think the, um, Title was, um, let me see, I wrote it down here. Or didn't I? Yes, I did. Um, out on the water, uh, shadows of clouds drifting north. So, with this model, I started to become, you know, I, I realized the possibility of this is a detail of it. Um, but this little figure looking out at the horizon, 
kind of a wasteland. Um, and I, I guess I looked at some Caspar David Friedrich paintings, which I had always loved, and started kind of building that thematic into these models. I don't know how, how much you're familiar with Caspar David Friedrich, so I'll include two pictures here. Here's one. They always have a figure, these are romantic paintings, figure looking toward the horizon, which is usually separated from him by several levels of mist or cloud. There are a ton of these paintings. There's always this longing for the landscape. And uh, I figured that into these models. Here's another Caspar David Friedrich, with somewhat more sinister edge because this is um, probably sailing ships bringing loot back from various colonies. Um, you know, here what's over the horizon involves like, you know, capitalist and imperial looting. Um, um, in any way. So going back to this painting, there's, there's some of that going on, but I mean, it's a sculpture. But the thing that interested me about this is that, okay, I could make the sculpture, but then I could also um, uh, include this text, which was like another, like a level of drawing almost added to the sculpture where I could tell you how to think of it poetically. So there was a space between the, the text and the model, but also the model was on a table, which you don't see here, but you could walk around it. And so you could look at it from this angle, look over at the man looking at the horizon, but you could also go around to the horizon and look right back at him, or you could look at it from the side. Um, and I thought that was uh, important. Um, here's another um, one that the title for this was Inland, Inland Birds Drifted in Slow Silent Circles. Um, crashed airplane, obviously, Piper Club, Piper Cub. I guess I was thinking of Robert Smithson when I made this piece, who crashed his small airplane. Um, all right, so, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about this piece. This is another one. This, I took the figures out of the models very early. That Those were kind of the last ones that had figures in them. And um, I started, these like, to me in a way, became kind of like paintings, right? They were constructed geometrically. Um, I kind of thought about the way it was laid out and balanced, like looking from the top. And um, these are the tables I used on a lot of the models. And there was a lot of criticism in my tables, you know, no, nope, like most people didn't like them. And nor did they like the sides of my piece. So you can see here, like how it's just made out of like low grade plywood really. Um, and like all the evidence of how it's constructed is visible on the edges. So like within the piece, it's really in pretty good shape. It's pretty realistic, you know, but the moment you get to the edge, it's pretty jarring. It's on a crappy table that stands awkwardly in the space and reveals all of how it was made. And to me, that was important because I liked, I liked the disjuncture between the two types of spaces. There was a space of the model, and then there was the space of our space. And you had to negotiate the, the kind of the, the separation between the two. You couldn't avoid it in a way. There was no, no way of avoiding the edge. Um, which I thought was good. So it put you kind of in a critical mode. You had to think about the construction and you, then you could think about the fantasy of the world for a little while, the world I had created. So you had to rotate between the two. Um, and there's something else I, I, I learned at this, at this point that I think, um, and this is not a fiction, it was what I actually learned at this point, which helped me, it was, was really interesting in thinking about when I made the models. Um, I read this book by Susan Stewart called On Longing, which is about the miniature and the gigantic. Um, and she talks about what happens in terms of time, like perceptual time, when you're in a, in, a, in a miniature. Like, I really enjoyed making these miniatures and there was like something fascinating to building them that I couldn't really put my finger on until I read this book. <clears throat> and she was talking about the way time is perceived differently in miniature time. And she um, gives an example of this, well, she gives as evidence this, scientific study that was um, done on uh, subjects who were playing with a small 
doll in a in a small waiting room. So they had three waiting rooms that were exactly the same, um, different scales. So one was one sixth scale, one was one twelfth, and one one twenty fourth. And what the what the uh, researcher did was measure the amount of time. He told he told subjects, "I want you to play with this little figure in the waiting room." Um, and be bored. That's fine. Doesn't matter. You're the subject's in the waiting room for a half hour. I want you to play with this sub with the little figure in the waiting room for a half hour. And then he recorded when they thought that half hour was up. And after in the one sixth scale, a half hour seemed to be over to most people in about five minutes. Um, in one twelfth scale, which is half the size, right? half hour seemed to be over in two and a half minutes and in 124th scale the smallest scale a half hour seemed to be over in one and a half minutes so there's a real kind of i mean what that means is that a shorter actual duration gives for a longer temporal experience if you're working on i noticed like i had no sense of time when i came out of working on these models sometimes especially if i was working on something on the interior um like you'd come out and like have to readjust, right? Like I've been, I felt like I'd been in there longer than I was. And I think sometimes this happens in painting as well. So, which might account for like why we're so interested in making art, you know, like our world literally changes when we're making things in different scales. Okay, is the detail of that piece. <clears throat> Those are big pens, I think. That's what the pipeline pieces are. Like, so a lot of this stuff I just found. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> then at this point, I also started to become super interested in, <clears throat> in gardens. So that what I realized was I was constructing these models very geometrically and precisely calculating and angles, and that kind of thing. And then somehow I stumbled upon this book about um, European gardens which which endlessly fascinated me which I had never like nobody talked about gardens when I was in art history class but I realized that gardens like and this book makes quite clear that gardens were like one of the major art forms of in Europe you know from from the Renaissance on I mean and, and they were like massive artworks you know I mean in the sense that the amount of labor to, involved in producing these the amount of kind of calculations and drawings that preceded them um, was incredible. And I guess what interested me about gardens is that like a garden reveals the way, an idealized way of thinking about the world. You know, so, so somebody who had a lot of money and a lot of power could, could kind of make this mirror of an idealized world for themselves. So that was like, there were like a reflection of how they wanted to see reality and there's like a lot of these gardens like have these like really incredible vanishing points you know that they project themselves toward the horizon something miniature on the horizon they play with scale and angles of descent and ascent and that kind of thing hidden pools that emerge as you walk down the path i don't know how many of you have been to versailles but it's quite an amazing experience to, to walk it actually um the other thing that interested me about gardens is that gardens also like make room for some sort of uncanny like occurrences like things that like slip outside of the logic of the garden because a garden in a way like can be constructed like as tightly as the architect wants to construct it but nonetheless right plants are plants right weather is weather you know, windstorms are windstorms, things come down, things grow irregularly. I mean, you can, can try to control it, but in the end, to a large extent, as we all know, gardens, you know, get out of hand, right? Um, so given that I was making these kind of industrial landscapes, I decided to, to consider them and I was constructing them, you know, with plywood, I was leveling the ground here. Here's an example of one of the, like, a, a, this was a, a recent drawing of, I think, Beau le Vicomte, yes, Beau le Vicomte, um, which shows you the elevation and the, um, you can look from above and you can look from the, down below, you can see on the side, like an exaggerated view of the topography change and all that's engineered. That is exactly kind of what I was doing in my models. So I decided to think of them as gardens. I was constructing miniature gardens. 
<clears throat> so this one was kind of my sub industrial sublime garden. It was a, basically a 21 foot causeway across a swamp. I was imagining it maybe somewhere outside of New Orleans. So you basically have a resin swamp and down the middle you have this um, highway, elevated highway with a pipeline. <clears throat> um, and I decided I would, this is kind of like a vanishing point in Bola Vicomte, but an industrial version of it, because I figured that those gardens, you know, like created an idealized version of the world that we have inherited and it's still projected even into our day to day landscape. There's still vestiges of that thinking and everything that, you know, we, we construct for ourselves. So that's the long view of this piece. And this is kind of a condensed detail looking down. So I guess I was thinking of the sublime, like how does one create something that feels sublime? And vastness is part of like, you know, the definition of the sublime. So I made lots of repeating forms, you know, the dots on the highway, telephone poles, you know, the the joints of the pipeline, etc. cetera. Um, and then I had this truck, you know, setting off along the pipeline headed for the horizon. And I'll just go through a bunch of other pieces that I made at the time. Um, I made about a hundred of these in a, in a very short course of time, um, like probably about four years before I had burned out on them. Uh, this is the piece that maybe Max saw at the Whitney Biennial. Um, this is like a 20 some, I forget what it was, 25 foot piece of a pipeline going through the desert and some little trucks headed along the pipeline. Um, this was an installation and not a piece. The, the dust was all sprinkled about and the dust was diatomaceous earth, which is pool used in pool filters, but each one is the skeleton of a kind of, I think a Jurassic, um, almost microscopic creature. Each one is kind of different than the next. Um, and it's very fine dust. It's actually can be, can be very dangerous. So the room had to be sealed while this was being sprinkled down. Um, but it was the nice thing was it held I don't know. Yeah, you can. It was so fine this dust that it could hold the tire tracks of these little trucks, and the trucks were only like, you know, half an inch long. They're really small. These are some of the last ones I made. I kind of thought of them as painting too, you know. I mean, because like here, you know, the the water it was like mud and water and glue, and you know you let it flow around until it set and then locked into place. It's kind of like an abstract painting. I also realized that if you took the axis off center, right? Like this, like, I don't know what, maybe 10 degrees off, off the perpendicular, that you can get a sense of space that's much faster than if everything is lined up with the sides perfectly. It feels like part of a larger hole when you do that. Uh, this is a real departure here. This is a piece uh, that similar in 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 in, in, uh, in a way I mean it was still a garden so this was I got a video camera <clears throat> and I started playing around with it and there was this site uh, an abandoned military installation in New Jersey Sandy Hook <clears throat> that uh, I had walked around as a kid at a lot I was abandoned at some point and then turned into a national park um, but there was one site in particular that always interested me and that was this uh, kind of a, a proving ground where like um, naval cannons were tested firing out over the ocean and down and down the shoreline um, and had been abandoned and it it um 
the, the site was super interesting to me because it seemed like haunted really in in so by, like by, by all kinds of architecture and by so many structures in our modern world and i'll go through so what it consisted of essentially were were 12 still video shots basically a camera turned on for 50 seconds um and and, and just recorded and there were the sound of birds and crickets and that kind of thing but otherwise it was really silent um and these uh, the, and i what i did is basically rotated through three at a time out of the 12 um you know kind of syncopated these these uh, shots and uh, and you'd sit in the middle and you'd hear the sound coming from all sides and um you know a screen would change when you least expected it but so it was like sitting in a garden and and looking out in in different directions so um that was the installation this was at andrea rosen this piece later went to documenta though um where it was completely overwhelmed because it was so quiet by all its neighbors who were loud um and the curator apologized you know that all these loud video videos had drowned out my crickets <laughs> which he hadn't anticipated so these are still stills from the shots right and this site was amazing gun uh, guns were mounted on these bolts right um and they fired you know and these are like cement walls were designed to protect whoever was there from like blast whatever in case it blew up um but they're all and they've had these huge rail these rail carts would come in and bring the munitions in so there are rail line the rail tracks but the rail tracks are like 15 feet apart instead of like the normal amount so the whole thing is like a weird kind of scale um i mean what i, I mean what i saw here is like, like like echoes and as we go through it you'll maybe you'll see some of what i was talking about i was kind of interested in like kind of like military space you know and how it projects into the landscape um but also like it referred to like infrastructural space in general um and i was interested in the way the vanishing points you know that you could see and that the camera uh, picked up on you know what 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 they were pointing at you know both symbolically and physically um and i was interested in all the histories you know kind of like fed into like the this space i'll go through it quickly this is another shot um So I spent a lot of time walking around here and just sitting and looking at it from different points of view, um, even long before I started shooting it. And like, I felt like this, I made a list of the things I felt I saw here, like, like in terms of like ghosts of other places, um, Stonehenge, right? Like in some of these kind of things, right? Stonehenge, Mayan temples, you know, with the steps going up, Pompeii, like abandoned missile silos, um, there was a hint of like concentration camp, abandoned concentration camps. And I don't know if any of you have been to Mussolini's EUR outside of Rome, but there's like sometimes echoes of that kind of space. De Chirico, like I'd always been a fan of De Chirico paintings. And this really seemed to embody kind of the, the sense of the haunted space of De Chirico, you know, um, who had a lot of trains like running in the distance of his, his paintings and strange cement archways. And it seemed like to me also like a very James, uh, J.G. Ballard kind of place. I don't know how many of you've read Ballard, but this seemed very Ballardian to me. So yeah, that's that was this project. Um, it's a standalone video project. I've done a number of others, but this was, let's see, how are we doing on time here? Uh, 719, I guess I should move fast. Okay, then I did this photo project. This is like the first big photo project I did. Um, in the New Jersey Meadowlands, where I decided to play around with uh, kind of this weird, I don't know how many of you have been to the Meadowlands, um, but it's its like an industrial swamp just across from Manhattan. Um, and it it's, it's really strange. I mean, because it's, whereas Manhattan is built on hard bedrock, Meadowlands is built on like silt and the bedrock is way down there, in some cases, 250 feet down. So everything you build in the Meadowlands kind of sinks into the muck at some point. And so everything's crumbling in a way and it's swampy. So it smells bad. And in New, New York City dumped its garbage in the Meadowlands for decades until you know the garbage dumps filled up. Um, 
so and there's a lot of industrial sites and, and rail sites kind of infrastructural stuff and it's possible to walk around there and get extremely lost i had a good friend and we, we basically did a year-long photo project out there where sometimes we would separate and you know this is kind of before we had cell phones and we couldn't find each other so we we had these had to find these like ways to like meet up um and sometimes the other person wouldn't be there so um, so that's a map from above, uh, and this is another like strange map. Now it's really hard to walk there because since 9-11, you know, anybody walking out there is suspect because there are chemical plants and whatever, and you basically get arrested if you try to go out there more than, I mean, you know, I don't know, my friend was dragged in handcuffs just for photographing with a, like an eight by 10 camera, the police stopped him asking what he was doing and and uh yeah he was beat up pretty bad um so this was the project i finished it just before 9 11 actually um this was actually was commissioned by document I saw some early pictures i took and then said can you can you finish this project off we'll give you a little funding um to do it so that's what it was a grid i used a a, a, a panoramic camera um, I experimented with a whole bunch of cameras, but I use a panoramic and very specifically, let's see, I'll get to some, there is another shot of it. <clears throat> so what I liked about it is that um, the space seemed really uh, to reflect everything that like we try to deny about our own landscape. It's, it's like, it, it, I liked it because it felt honest, you know, like what's happening out there, you can see it. There's no facade, right? Um, everything that everybody cares about is in Manhattan or on the other side in New Jersey. But when you get to this particular part of New Jersey, it's just anything, anything goes. <clears throat> so you have this kind of, also the other thing I liked about it too, was that it was like a maze. It was like um, a labyrinth and you could, there was a sense that you couldn't get out of it when you were in it. And I photographed this with a, with a um, everything was shot in middle distance, right? I mean, if the panoramic camera is designed, right, to find the vanishing point. And that's like how everybody uses it, like broad, expansive shots towards the horizon, grander. You know, you imagine the, the, the panoramic camera being used in the, you know, in the, in the, in the West somewhere, right? But I was using it here and to the, <clears throat> purposefully to, to make it so that there was like no point of escape in these photographs. And that the, when you came up to look at the photographs, you would also get lost in that maze. And there was like kind of this dizzying experience that I was trying to relate that happened while walking. I was trying to parlay that into the images themselves and also looking at the images because you'd come close and then you would the photographs were kind of non-distinct in a way. I think a photo curator at the time, when I when it went up at Documenta, said to me, she said, you know how your photographs are really bad, she said. Are you aware how bad they are? And I said, yeah, kind of. You know, but they're bad because I meant them to be bad in exactly this way. And she said, well, you need to look at the Bechers. They'll show you how to organize a photograph. Formally. And I said, I've looked at a ton of the Bechers, but this is not what they're doing, you know. Um, they were chaotic on purpose. Except there was one picture that isn't chaotic, and that was at the center. So I'll get to that. And that center was like around which everything revolved. So these are individual shots, just so you can see what they look like. up close. <clears throat> and these are shot in film on an X-Pan uh, X-Pan camera, which is a Hasselblad camera. So this is the center picture. It had a vanishing point <laughs> and everything kind of revolved around this one photograph. 
okay so let's go quickly um i started making these uh i just started making a bunch of cardboard models which i referred to max referred to um they started from this picture of mexico city which i liked and i started then i went out to google earth and started looking at mexico city but also other cities from i like started just going through all these cities around the world and i started noticing like this the same kind of pattern especially in a lot of kind of um cities that have been colonized one way or another where they um they where the grid dominates you know but within the grid there are these little compounds that take all kinds of different forms so um here i'll just go through some of the compounds and kind of a kind of a a rationalized city plan. This is Kabul, I think. This is from, I believe, Niger. This could be from Mali. And so then I built a cardboard version of it. And this was the first cardboard version. I, it took me a long time to build this thing. <clears throat> I wasn't sure why I was doing it either, honestly. Um, but I felt like this need to do it. And so basically, I took kind of industrial parts. Every piece of cardboard was sized like in like to kind of standardized proportions and then i made the city out of those standard pieces but i tried to make every house specific like i imagined i was the owner and that given the materials um, at my disposal i would make the house as nice as i could um imagining i, I had i was only able to find these kind of materials this is a copy of a detail of it so I built this whole city in my studio. I didn't know what to do with it. And then I got a sculpture center um, wanted me to do an installation of this in the basement of the sculpture center. And I realized that city wouldn't fit. So I had to rebuild it. So this is a rebuilding of that entire city, but on like a quarter scale of what that other one was. <clears throat> so I, this is it. This is the installation. I really like the kind of the corridor in which it was in. And you could look down it. Um, it kind of gave you a vanishing point. And I put the city way down at the end, so you couldn't really see what was going on out there. And I realized that I started thinking of this as like a, as a model built from the perspective of a, of a helicopter. And this was the time when, you know, that I guess it was, um, was it WikiLeaks said, you know, published that video footage of, well, first of all, there was like all this, the like the, the evidence that justified the Iraq war, you know, is that there were these trailers that were like making poison you know, but like they just look like any other trailer, you know, and they could have been photographs of any trailer. So I was imagining like what it would look like to like a Western kind of for a Western flyover, like an American flyover of, of, of a city, you know, that 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 represented fear, you know, or the other in the eyes of, of kind of a Western intelligence agency or a Western pilot. Like, what do you see out at the end of this card? You know, is that a army base or is that what is that down there and you weren't allowed to walk out there so you had to sit at this end and just look at it <clears throat> so this is this is like a privileged view because i walked out and took a closer view of it um and i did another version of it at session in vienna this was the installation i did for them it's just same same components but it's just a different space and these cardboard the cardboard ground with just like local boxes that i just like i asked them to collect boxes for me and then i glued them down on the ground another detail this was from you know, i did this in uh, cincinnati in a much smaller space to figure out how to work with the existing architecture and then okay we'll just while i was at google earth looking around because of the novelty at the time i started looking at i didn't start noticing prisons um and then just started doing screen captures of prisons which fascinated me because uh in terms of like their their plan you know the way they were laid out it looked like they were designed to be looked at from the air honestly i mean when you look at it from the ground you don't see any of this but this seems designed specifically for the eyes of somebody above and i was wondering if it was how they sold them the architect sold the model to the uh, to the authorities to say you know this this is the kind of you know social machine you want in your state 
or this is like what your state prison should look like, a machine for processing people um, and, and people you don't want in your society. So, I mean, there was this kind of diabolical quality, but like this strange diabolical beauty at the same time. So uh, these are various, I mean, this, this is an older prison. This is one of the first radial prisons from like, uh, this is from Philadelphia. Um, some of these go way back to the eight, 1800s. I think this is the more recent version, but there's an earlier one, um, just like a mile away, built on the same plan. Then this is a machine for, you know, it's got, it's, you know, it has viewpoints down all the axes so you can really see what's going on from the center, kind of panoptical kind of situation. It's a Spanish prison, which I built a model of, I'll show you in a second. Um, is Rikers Island with a proliferation of different prison types. Um, forgetting where this is from. I think it's from Philadelphia as well. I could be wrong. This is an English prison. This might be from Illinois, I'm not sure. This is from Nevada. That's also from Nevada. It's from New Jersey. There are several prisons with exactly the same kind of module that they use over and over again. This is a, a juvenile center outside of Philadelphia. <clears throat> and that's also Nevada. Anyway, uh, that's California. All the California prisons look a little like this. I forget where this is from. That's the largest French prison. I think it's the largest prison in Europe, actually. It's huge. So I built some models. Uh, and I, these were meant, so I built kind of just, I took out the windows. I turned them to abstract sculptures, really. Um, <clears throat> just out of cardboard and um, put them on the wall. This is kind of unfinished in a way. I wanted it to be unfinished. There were two ways of looking in, um, like this here. You could look into here. But the thing about these prisons that I liked is that you, well, I, 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 they, I wanted them to be on the wall so you approached them from the air, you know, so to speak. When you walked up to them, you were taking kind of the aerial view as you like coming down on the prison. That's the Spanish one there. All right, and then we'll get to this. These are just, okay, I think we're probably running out of time soon. Max, tell me if, if I'm going too long. These are <clears throat> a couple people that I did studio visits with today and mentioned these pieces. So I just thought I'd show you them. Uh, this is, so these are constructed photographs. Um, these are photographs I made, you know, with spray paint and stencils. Um, uh, basically invented photographs. They don't really exist. Um, but I was trying to create like what I thought were kind of uncanny photographs. Um, photographs that like that, that had like as their subject kind of haunted spaces, you know, that kind of emerged from the, um, our collective unconscious somehow. We were made with stencils and a couple basic spray paints and they were mostly on cardboard. Some of them were on uh, sandpaper because it has a nice grain, you know, picks up the grain, looks like a photograph. You can see the ridges of the cardboard, the corrugated cardboard on this one. And these, these things are really small. They're only like at, at biggest, like 18 inches. They're really hard to do, you know, they mess up. You can try like four or five before you get one to work. Some of them were recognizable. I and mean, this like was not from an actual, I drew, I did did a drawing of this and from the drawing, I turned it into a stencil and then, then I used spray paint. <clears throat> this is on, on a, this is on sandpaper. So, as is this. This is some piece of plastic I found, but I realized it could look like a building under construction. A 
All right. So, um, Max, we didn't get to talk about uh, the book at all. I can go into it if you want briefly, but uh, we're kind of at an hour here. So I'll let you decide or any everybody else decide if we want to talk about that briefly. And this isn't it. I mean, I would I don't want to talk about this book. This is Long Branch. We'll leave this off. Uh, yeah. It's up uh, to you. I don't I don't want to hold you back from from sharing uh, a little bit more of your work. I also uh, if you want to do that and then still have a little bit of time for I am, I'm sure there are some questions and comments that people have for you as well. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I'm saying go for it. I'll go for it. I'll be fast. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. Great. Thank you. Because <laughs> um, I, I think it's an interesting piece, actually. It's a piece I'm proudest of, actually, of all the pieces I've made. So um, let's, let's see if we can find it here. Um, maybe this is it. I don't know. Okay, let's go. All the, yeah, let's go to here. So um, this is the most recent book uh, out of the books I've made. I made four altogether. Um, first was 2000. The others have been since 2014. <clears throat> this book involves photographs that I took in the Mojave Desert over like four years. So I took literally about 800 viable pictures that have been shown as a grid um, in, in Athens and in New York City. Um, um, but of those 800 viable pictures, uh, I selected uh, 256 for this book. Um, uh, no, actually 210. It's a 256 page book. And I worked with a publisher, um, um, Hans Gremen uh, from FW Books in, uh, in Amsterdam. And he was my collaborator. And he, I wanted to work with him because he's a, he's, a he's a good publisher. He said he wouldn't work with me unless you know, we collaborated. And I said, well, I need a collaborator. So it's working out perfectly. I said, I have this text I really like. I have these images I like. I feel like they go together, but I don't know how to put them together exactly. So uh, I have to credit him with the design of this book and also for the logic, which I think completely channeled what needed to be done in this book. So basically it's a, it's a text that I wrote like before I took the photographs, I wrote this starting in like 2009 um, and it took about a year to write. And what I did is uh, every phrase starts with the, every sentence starts with the phrase, were it not for. <clears throat> and then I wrote it at night. So like in the dark, I had a pad next to my bed. And if I thought of a sentence, I would, I would write it out and I'd write a bunch of them. So I usually write five or 10 at a time and stick it back under the bed then transcribe it in the morning. And I did a little editing. I moved it around after the fact. So it's not exactly in order. But so they're like kind of like kind of um, bunches of, of sentences that kind of make sense together. <clears throat> and what I was looking for were, were the languages of language of our times, really, in a way, like cliches on the one hand, like neoliberal cliches, but also phrases that describe um, like real obstacles. So what, what it is is basically a, ca a catalog of obstacles, obstacles to doing either the right thing uh, to like for social change and it, all in terms of language what gets in the way some of it and, and some of them are real so some of it, it like it involves a border which somebody's trying to cross it can't cross so it involves like infrastructural like minefields and that kind of thing it involves like and it's also set in the desert so there's kind of a specificity to where it takes place so like a desert border is kind of implicit in this but also <clears throat> the sense that whoever is the narrator like i guess there is no narrator but if, if there's an if there's something that's holding somebody back is holding them back in sort of a in, in a lifestyle that it's holding the language is holding back whatever is happening right and some of it's valid language and some of it's just kind of excuses that are, are made in our society and so that's the, kind of the register in which it it, it operates so he started, he started off by just like forefronting the language because he knows that photographers often like the purity of the photograph and that the language will come second. So let's just start off with language, get into it. <clears throat> so he goes for it's a 640 line poem um, or text. And he just started off with like five pages of it. So here you can see, um, I, I guess, can anybody read this? Is it possible to read it on your end? 
yeah probably okay so that's that's the cover it's like a cardboard cover and then it, that's the inside of the cover and it goes then it starts just going into and it's eight and a half by 11 so it's a big book i'll let you read it just a few lines you can just sample them to see where this thing goes <clears throat> And I should say that when I wrote this, I wrote, wrote it as, as a speech in a way. I meant to have it read and I read it a number of times. I read it in, um, I read it in uh, Aarhus in Denmark um, for a situationist international kind of, <laughs> an attempt to restart the situationist international. I, I read this with the bottle of Powers whiskey in one hand and I finished off the bottle as I read this as kind of, I, I didn't actually end with the end of it, I ended when I was drunk. So that was that was the way this, this piece started out. And it's been read a number of times since, albeit not with the Powers Whiskey. So here we go. Now it goes a couple more pages like this. And then all of a sudden the imagery starts. And so like where the imagery starts, like the, text is not choreographed to that it happenstance that under the first image it says were it not for the media circus he changed the font size and it it, it brought up a different like first line of text i didn't care what i was interested in was okay these images were fragments of a world that we created you know and this text are fragments of language from a world we created so they should have a relationship together and i didn't know you know like it's not a causal relationship it's a kind of an uncanny relationship these things all exist in the same world what happens when you put them together so that's what this this book does <clears throat> so sometimes in, in a funny way the text really makes sense with the image in some case it makes very little sense but i think even if it doesn't make sense you can try to stretch your like imagination like how many degrees of separation would it take for that text to make sense with the image and that's really what the book is so we can just i'll go through a bunch of images the images were basically um, taken, uh, they're all vertical and um, they foreground the, the ground in many cases, kind of looking down the high horizon line. They're kind of what you see when you're on the ground um, in California, which is like the Mojave Desert. You think of it like you, people think of the Western American landscape as some sort of like grandiose kind of space. But in fact, it's really messed up when you look at it, there's like garbage everywhere. Everything that gets dropped on the ground stays there forever. Um, you know, you go on an off ramp, I'll get off the off ramp, there's a pile of garbage there. It's like somebody just dumped their stuff there. Um, it's like a real estate sign with kind of Native American protest against the sale of their land. And there are captions where there's no image, suggesting that any image could go there in a way. Some of these phrases, like I, I, I pull from meetings, you know, I'd hear somebody say something, and then like, like the time-tested methods, or I don't know, they're kind of the, in some cases, not necessarily these. There's something relentless about the book. There are, in a way, almost too many images and too many lines of text, but it's almost meant to seem infinite, you know, which is kind of what both the publisher and I were thinking needed to happen. <clears throat> it's a brick of a book. It's pretty, like a, an inch thick and And I should say that these photographs are taken for me in a way that this is the way I've photographed a number of these these uh, books, recent books. So I take the picture horizontally, right? It's a it's a landscape image, but it's not meant to exist horizontally. It's meant to exist vertically. So I crop out, uh, I crop a slice down the middle of the photograph, and and then I can adjust the photograph exactly. Like there's there's part of an image to the right and the left. But exactly what's to the right and what's to the left, um, I 
I do by cropping. Um, and I, I can make some of the pictures uncomfortable that way or comfortable. Um, I feel like I could take a picture that's predictable and make it unpredictable by messing it up a bit, you know, like cutting a car in half or, um, yeah, like this one on the right here was much more like balanced in a way than how I cropped it. I'm expecting to crop it. So I wanted these pictures to feel like a glance that you wouldn't even notice when you're walking along, you know, that, that they had that quality of, of real kind of, um, nondescriptness. Anyway, so that's the book. It just keeps going. All right. It's just, Oh, this is one I really like. This I'll show you a picture I really like. I like the one were it not for Vietnam. It's one of my favorite photographs. It's like that's the American landscape right there. <laughs> yeah, tons of debris. All right, folks, I guess we can, that, that's a good place to knock it off. It, I just, just, I'll just go to the end so you can see what it looks like at the end. At the end, we, uh, okay, we come out of the text and then we go into the a last page of text and then it ends in some, it says, we're, okay, the last three lines say, we're not for the wreckage on the beach, we're not for the oceans of sand, we're not for the shifting of dunes and then we go to the end the colophon and we go and then the last picture and the last line is on the back of the book which says we're not for the dunes beyond the dunes and that's where the book ends all right i'll stop sharing look at all your faces again sorry yeah. i went so long everybody i hope i didn't no 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 nuts. worries no, that was that was terrific. I'm glad that you got to the that last project as well. Yeah, I mean, I could have put so much else in too. It's, at this point, it's getting kind of ridiculous. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it was really it's it's so interesting to see all of these bodies of work right up uh, alongside one another like this. You know, starting off obviously speaking about perspective and seeing how in groupings you know in bodies of work you're shifting from you know something objective something that's like these three quarter views talking about framing one element in the landscape an extraction from a bigger landscape and then moving from the inside out you know a more subjective point of view of the photographs and then back out again but a change happened there when you start doing these aerial models where you're no longer close enough in talking about detail. So it's clear that you're directing us to think about systems and grids and not, you know, the texture of chemical, you know, wasteland. Um, and that it's, it's just, that keeps, you keep shifting back and forth around the subject matter with such continuity um, in what you're interested in, but in, kind of directing us. So in that way, it's very cinematic to see all together like that. Um, let's hear from some of the folks here in the room. Um, I know that there were some questions along the way. So feel free to just um, activate your mic and, and speak up. I had a quick question about um, the sculptures where you had the water. Was that made out of like acrylic, like clear acrylic that you poured or? Yeah, it was in, I think they still sell it. It was made out of uh, something called Envirotex, which is a resin, um, pretty toxic actually. <laughs> you really need to use a uh, full face respirator because it leaves a film on your eyeballs. <laughs> it can mess up your eyesight permanently. Um, yeah, so it was, it was, uh, it was uh, Envirotex which I bought at like Lowe's or, um, but I also got these dyes. So little drops, but little drops in there. 
I was pretty good at kind of constructing various muddy water kind of solutions. Um, yeah, and, and then I would, you know, the piece had to be level and then I would dam off the sides, you know, and pour it in and it didn't always work, you know, <laughs> but yeah. I have a quick question. Um, how many, like on average, how many man hours does it take to finish one of Those, your pieces? Oh, the models? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. So, I mean, it sometimes went faster than you might think. I mean, the big long causeway probably took like a month. Um, my dad helped me on that. We built that in his basement. <clears throat> that was quite a project. Um, but some of them, some of the smaller ones would take a couple days, really. But I, I would say on average, like a week or two per piece. Um, it required a lot of planning out to, you know, beforehand, like where, what should the elevation be like, you know, like how, how deep, you know, should this be that kind of thing? What, what should the angle be like and all that? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, what would you say like your most, like in your opinion, your most successful piece was or like the piece you're most happy with? Oh, I think I'm most happy with the last book because that's kind of what I'm interested in now. I kind of like working in photography now because it's, I don't know, I like being out in the world. I mean, right now I'm working on this book of photographs around Ithaca of all places where I live and I don't know. I, I just, I did. I started it in lockdown. It was great to walk around, you know, in a kind of an abandoned city and take pictures. Um, and and I like writing, so I'm writing a text that goes with it. And there's something about writing that allows me to express the piece more, express myself more fully, you know. It, it, but the writing is hard. It's really hard to write while in, in conjunction with making a visual piece, because if it if it gets too literal, it fails, you know. So every every book that I've done has involved language of some sort, but I've had to approach each one dif differently. And each the most difficult part is finding the language. But it's also I find it extremely rewarding to you know to finally succeed in getting that to work together. Um, on the when you're describing the panoramic photographs that you're kind of using the camera against or in a different way than maybe most people tended to but the the statement of someone coming up and saying that they weren't go, good photographs and your response i thought was really fascinating um i'm just thinking when i did photography in undergraduate and i i realized that that a poorly printed photograph was a way to communicate a feeling that a properly uh printed photograph could never do and um that didn't go over very well with the instructor but um I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this idea that sometimes when you're trying to achieve a goal with your art making, it might require challenging what good art or what a great photograph is supposed to be. Right. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I mean, that comes up over and over again, right? I mean, like, especially in like when you're teaching sculpture or you're teaching photography, you know, like somebody would say, well, this photo teacher told me this wasn't a good photograph. I said, well, what was wrong with it? Like, what were you trying to do with the photograph that made it a bad photograph? And so, like, I think that so many of these questions are, like, contextualized. I mean, I had a, I had a, I had a sculpture professor talk to me about my models and, like, really complain about some of the materials I was using, you know, like suggesting much better woods and, and much finer tables. And, um, but I think, you know, they, like, it's really, you have to think of, in sculpture, if you're using objects, right? And these objects have meaning in the world. And so you have to choose your objects really specifically, like like a fine plywood meat would mean something completely different than, than a crappy industrial plywood, you know? Um, photograph, Printed photograph is, you know, I mean, there are a, 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 a bad photograph is one that's printed that doesn't say exactly what you want it to say, right? And I admit that some of my photographs could have been printed better, right? But I think she was more commenting on the way they were organized, kind of the informality of it. Um, I do print too dark, you know, and I do that on purpose. 
but I don't know what the correct, because the eye and the photograph do two completely different things. So what, what is the correct photograph, right? I'm not sure. Like, I mean, if you rub your eyes or you look into the sun for a second and look at the landscape, it's a completely different thing, right? You know, like there is no correct aperture setting for your eye, nor, you know, I don't know. And what is a correctly printed photograph in terms of color either? So you have to think about the effect you're trying to get. I have a question. Yes. So at the beginning, you talk about like um, your miniature scale, like sculpture. And then at the end, like on your book, you had this like text that were like miniature and like also like the time of reading. What's the relation? What do you say at this point with the book? How would you describe the time of reading the lines? And would that be your inner voice kind of? You know, oh, the inner voice? Like oh. for a little tiny sculpture in this landscape, you could say. Right, right, right. Um, I guess there is an inner voice in there, you know, but it's like, I think it's always filtered through uh, a certain type of language that I choose to use in that situation. You know, so it always is me. And sometimes, you know, I guess as a kid, I always did have a fascination with the horizon, right? So that, that's always me. But I'm also suspicious of the fascination with the horizon. Somehow, um, like when I was a kid, there were, there were power lines that went behind my house and they went over the hill. I grew up in the woods, but those power, I would like walk along them, you know, for a while until I got tired or scared and then I'd walk home. And then I always like wonder, where do they go? You know, they go to Canada. I mean, how far north do they reach? You know, and like, what if I just kept going? So there's always that kind of like the, the sublime quest, you know. But then I also recognize that that sublime quest is like something you can never satisfy. So you'd keep walking and you'd never get to what it is you're trying to get to, right? And I think that somehow that's built into like Western metaphysics somehow. I think that's part of imperialism too, like in a way, you know, you follow that vanishing point and you're never happy with what you get and you always want more. And I think that has something to do with, you know, the way, you know, the Euro Europeans, you know, treated the rest of, I mean, the, the, the mapping, you know, the, the, the way of figuring out the way, kind of the mathematical structure of, of um, for single point perspective and isometric drawing for that matter is, is easily applied to mapping, you know, and, and and then and the mapping you know is, is a, they're, they're tools in a way for the domination of space you know so they, they try to dominate space but they also realize they can't completely dominate space so the built the, the longing and the domination seem part of a whole to me and I, and it worries me and, and I suspect that that yearning that I have you know is is could be a dangerous one Hi, so I have, two Oop, I have two questions. Sure. Um, and I was curious, so you work in like a presenting photos in a gallery space, but also you do books. And I'm curious, which one do you prefer and why? And the other question is um, like, although you have like really diverse influences and whatnot, but I see a lot of similarities in the new topographics movement. And I'm curious uh, on your opinion of that uh, movement and uh, its influence on you, if there is any. Yes, uh, that's both very good questions. Um, to answer your first question, um, yeah, I think that to, to a certain extent, the book is a turn away from the gallery scenario. Because I worked with commercial galleries um, and have had bad experiences many times with them, um, uh, which I don't, don't want to go, and the market in general, too. So I think the whole system, in a way, is, is kind of problematic. Um, from a purely um, kind of, uh, from what I want photography to do, like a, 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 an exhibition of photography. You, I mean, I've been around a long time and a lot of shows have gone up and come down and I can vaguely remember them, but they're gone. You know, the thing about an exhibition is that only a certain number of people see them and then they're, they're gone. And sometimes there's a catalog and, and, and sometimes there's not. But when you're dealing with photography, you know, um, 
I'm wondering if, if the gallery really is is the only place for 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 the photography to be exhibited. I mean, there was the idea, you know, that the the print itself that was on the wall was the thing that you know that was the that was the authority, right? And then everything else in a book was really just kind of a weak copy of what was on the wall. But I don't think that's the case. You know, I think photography now takes so many forms that the book can be the actual form of where photography resides. And that the real advantage a book has is that it's there forever and it's distributed and its life continues forever. I mean, people still read the book and get the book and comment on the book that I, books that I made in 2000 and one and, and 2014 and you know they have they, they're alive still you know and and whereas some of these exhibitions like the, the the pictures the panoramic pictures are not in a book and you know that there's no way to access them except through my website which is really not a good way to do it so yeah i mean you can see this is the case too as i like galleries you know there isn't it it's so hard to show a galleries this way, especially photography. There's like kind of a suddenly, a, a, you know, a, a mass spread of photographs, you know, in books. If you go to the Kim Art Book Fair when it reopens, you know, like LA Art Book Fair or Paris, the number of new books coming out is just incredible. Um, and I much prefer that way of living with photographs. You know, I have a big, I'm, I'm not rich, but I have a reasonable size of photo collection of photo books at this point. And they're always there to think about. And I really appreciate that. Um, and remind me what your second question was? Um, the uh, the influence of like uh, the new topic. Oh, yeah, movie. yeah. What's your opinion on that? Because it seems a lot really similar, you know? Yeah, it is. It's, I see it as a, I see it as a continuation of that work, you know, for <laughs> sure, Robert Adams and um, and, and then Lewis Baltz in particular, those are two that I, I really have always liked. Um, though I think I approach it, um, I guess with a little bit more, I'm trying to expand on that. So the introduction of language is something that I don't think they would do in quite that way. And I, I look, I look, I mean, I guess I probably have more in common with Baltz, although I like Robert Adams photographs better in many cases. Um, but I guess I bring, uh, a, you know, I guess I was probably a little more influenced by Marx than either of those two were, you know, you know, so that's, um, yeah, I think I, I, I think, I think they also thought that their photographs were objective in a way that I don't think any photograph really is. I don't think there's an objective view of the world. So that's, that's, and I think that photographs are so, contingent upon other forces and what you see and how you see it is so um, colored, you know, and intertwined and haunted in a way and everybody experiences them differently. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get people to see photographs, I guess, more like integrating more variables into the photograph than they were. And, I, and their photographs are great. And, and they were necessary in their time. I just think that we could go past that right now. Definitely, thank you, yeah. Sure, great. but I'm part of that tradition. I'm happy if the people want to include me in that, I'm happy to be included. <laughs> oh, there was another question that someone had a minute ago. Oh. Yeah, I, I was curious. Um, you seem to have a very realistic uh, image within your modeling it has a subliminal quality as well but then you're kind of undermining it with the structure of the bases that are very raw and uh, realistic you had mentioned that uh, within your talk and I was curious how you resolve that and the question before this kind of spoke to that in that you know, the Romans laid out a grid on the world. It was very structured, very linear, and you're reproducing that, but then you seem to undermine it with the base of those models itself. And I think also within the way in which you're photographing things. And so I was curious if you've found a resolution between those two dichotomies. Well, okay. I think the way I photograph and the way I build models are different. 
uh, in a lot of ways. So, it, I mean, building the models, even though they look realistic, they're not really realistic. So they're highly edited in terms of what details I allow on the surface of the model. You know, I mean, sometimes there's such thing as way too much detail. I kind of, I was, I, I kind of kept in my mind like Edward Hopper as a model for how I was making models. Like the way an Edward Hopper painting works is a real economy of detail. You know, he only put puts in what he thinks is necessary. You know, and that's how I saw building the models. You know, there were details in it, but I, how, how much a detail um, brought your attention to it was important. You know, like color, like something too bright or something too big um, upset the balance of, of the way the eye flowed around the model. So it was really constructed as a painting and, and like where the eye fell on the model surface was, was super important to me. I mean, it's it, like this code of photography, it's still round, right? But in a photograph, you can't choose what you put in it. I mean, you can choose what you edit out. But the, the kind of stuff that's really there, you know, when you look at it, as opposed to kind of idealized notion of what's there. So really, I'm editing something to, to increase the amount of detail or stray or incongruous detail in a photograph in a way that still balances in some weird way because the photograph has to work, you know, and that's a strange thing, you know. There are other photographs that work for my purpose and photographs that don't, but the eye has to move around a certain way and I'm really conscious of that. It's just the photograph is different. You're, you're confronted with real life situation. Um, but in terms of what you were saying, in terms of the model and the stand, there was contradiction and I like that contradiction that the eye would like fly out, of, like would all of a sudden catch some detail on the edge, you know, and be bothered by it, you know, and then have to find out, figure, find its way back in, like had to account for the fact that this was a crappy stand, like, right, and that, uh, I'm not sure I can completely explain why it had to be a crappy stand, but um, I don't know, it seemed part of the content of the work that, that I don't know. Maybe it's it's kind of my. I like me. I like. I also just simply like making things out of crap, you know, and having them look really good, but then also reveal. Like maybe it's part of my belief that everything is made out of crap these days, so let's just work with it, you know, make something look good out of it, but admit that it's crap, you know. <laughs> anyway, I think that that's probably part of it. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I use drywall screws. I could have used nice screws. I mean, I towed the screws, you know what I mean? I don't know. And they get beaten up. They get pieces of tape. People wouldn't pack them properly when they left the museum or something. And I left like marks on the, the surface I had to maintain, but the table, you know, after being assembled and reassembled 20 times, it was like a mess. People didn't even really think it was part of the work, you know, but it was. <laughs> yeah, I just wondered whether that been to your thesis or a hypothesis. And so while your work was very detailed, subliminal, picturesque, uh, if the stand itself was informing things further, which it sounds like it is, but yeah. uh, maybe I mean, on a less it... conscious level. Well, sometimes, no, I mean, it's like in a really nice gallery space, right? With pristine walls and everything. I like the fact you go from a really, what, it was like three steps. Then you go to the gallery itself, right? Because you have to look at the context of it. So the context of a really clean museum space and a, a crappy plywood table, and then a really finished surface. It's kind of like set up a bunch of contradictions, you know, which I liked, you know, like, cause the, and then you go from the gallery space to the real world, which incorporates like kind of New Jersey waistlines from across the river. So there's kind of a circle of, you know, like facade and crap, you know, going on as the, the different layers of the piece, right? If you start to contextualize the piece in a more broad fashion, then you realize that like a wasteland somewhere, you know, lurking in the back of the is connected to it in some way. Absolutely. Thanks. Sure.
And that seems also somehow related to your, oh, I have, seems like I have an unstable connection. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. I just, when you were describing, you know, having to wear a full face mask and the toxic nature of these materials, it's kind of interesting to think about what you've just been describing, the suspension of disbelief, making us a, a space where for the suspension of disbelief and then fracturing it with that edge or the kind of crappy made or handled materials on, on, a, on, a, on one aspect of it and also representing something toxic as beautiful, but then also having been made with materials that kind of, again, interrupt that, interrupt that and remind you to not get subsumed by the beauty of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's interesting that you say that because I'm, I'm interested, I've always been interested in Chernobyl as a, as a phenomenon, right? You know, like the way this radiation from this like technological um, experiment, right? You know, and, 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 flo and floods across Europe, you know, like basically it's an uncanny release, right? Of, of, You, you can't escape Chernobyl, even in a fancy gallery space. Or, and by the same token, way COVID nineteen works too. You know, like it's to our our misjudgment of like the way animals and and humans coexist is coming back to haunt us at this point. You know, so it's it's penetrating every space. It's penetrating the art world as well. You know, it's, it's taking its toll on like on on pretty much everything at this point. You know, our family relationships, the way we like the university system, right? And the art world, how we make art, think about it. It's, you know, I mean, in a way that's kind of, yeah, the ultimate toxic release in a way. Mm -hmm. Affecting our politics, you know, it's really good too. I think you know, like Black Lives Matter, you know, might not have, I mean, it's a bad thing. Like COVID-19 affected certain communities way worse than others, but it also relieved, released a frustration at, at kind of a larger structural forces in our society. But then on the other hand, it also released, you know, um, white supremacy, right? So in a, in a way that kind of more condensed. So, yeah, I, I, that's kind of my interest in, 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 in the uncanny. It's, it's like a society, like our, our, it seems like our world is built to like tries to control things positivistically, positivistically, like like technological solutions to problems, but the technological solutions are similar in a way to the technological problems that cause uh, the technological solutions that cause the problem in the first place, right? So, um, yeah, I guess I guess I mean, that's that's all the space I'm talking about is like what exists behind you know what we see. What are the other forces that lurk that can come out? And that we should understand and can we even see them you know like are we so programmed by our existing way of life that we even have any access to you know the, these these other worlds that are there but we don't understand you know so yeah, i always like that that uh riddle like cedric price line that technology is the answer but what is the question yes right <laughs> right right Beautiful, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, I mean, we we could leave it there if nobody else has a question. I mean, I've kept people a long time. I see not too many people have left, which is really kind of nice. <laughs> you guys are so polite. Um, Michael, uh, we really appreciate having you here. This is really great to great to have you share your work with us tonight. Yeah, I, it's been a pleasure being here. And and I mean, I met with four grad students today, which was a pleasure, made me wish I could meet a lot more people. <laughs> you know, you guys, yeah. you guys have a great program, I think. So, yeah, well, carry yeah. on, everybody. Yeah. Art's important. Art is the other way of seeing the world, right? That's where the forces are, you know, that's, that's, I think, really, yeah. I mean, in the university, I think the, that the art department is, in a way, probably the most, especially like in a place like Cornell, which is so technologically oriented, 
art is like the least understood department. But I think that, you know, it, if there are any kind of answers to these problems we're facing, like art holds perhaps a better clue than, than, than many of these other so-called, you know, these disciplines, right, which are so constricted in the way they understand the world. So what everybody's doing here, super important. Don't forget that. And even if you don't go on and make art for the rest of your life, you know, you've, you've learned something about thinking, you know, that isn't always available in other parts of the university. I don't know, that's my little spiel. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, well, I said as a chair of an art department, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if you open up your chat window, you can see the resounding gratitude for your, for your talk. Oh, wow. wow look at that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so nice. Yeah. You guys are the best. All right. Yeah. Thanks Carry on, much. everybody. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Nice thank to hear you. the talk, Michael. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.